Dr. Harold Honer, uh, who is now with the Lord, used to be the head of the PhD program at Dallas Seminary. So when I was accepted into the PhD program in Hebrew back in 85, when I was 27, uh, he, I got to know him. He was, uh, I was also a Greek major uh, long before I was a Hebrew major, so I knew Dr. Honer very well. Um, great man of God. Uh, he wrote his doctoral dissertation uh, on the chronological aspects of the life of Christ. So if you have any questions about chronology when it comes to Jesus, uh, his dissertation is uh, published, and it al is also uh, what you would need to read. It's exciting reading. Trust me, it is. It's very insightful. If you want to know, like, what happened when? Uh, so when was the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem? Well, according to Dr. Honer, it was a Monday. It was a Monday. Like, what year? Uh, it was 33 A.D., that's when Christ rode the donkey into town. And basically, like, why were all the people lining the streets and shouting Hosanna uh, to God in the highest? Blessed is the name of the Lord. Why were they lining the streets? And why did they have palm branches, of all things? Was that just an arbitrary thing that they chose? No. Uh, what they were doing is, uh, number one, they had heard that Jesus had uh, raised Lazarus from the dead. They'd either seen it had family members who saw it, had friends who saw it. They showed up in mass because wouldn't that get your attention? If everybody, like, the guy was dead for a couple of days, and he just stood at the mouth of the tomb and said, what? Lazarus, do what? Come forth. And had he not said Lazarus' name, what would have happened? Everybody would have come forth. Good thing he said Lazarus, huh? So everybody was lined up there, waving the palm branches, you know, shouting with happy voices, Hosanna uh, to Jesus on the donkey, etc. cetera. Um, what were they doing? Well, from an Old Testament perspective, they were uh, celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. But it wasn't the time of Feast of Tabernacles. It was Peshach. It was Passover. What were they doing? Well, they were so excited because they know of the seven feasts of Israel. There's a prophetic value to the seven feasts of Israel. And so they were skipping from Passover straight to number seven, the Feast of Tabernacles, which Isaiah, or, uh, Zechariah says in chapter 14 that when the Messiah comes uh, in chapter 13, he will redeem Israel as a nation. Chapter 14, he will set up his kingdom in Jerusalem, uh, and they will observe the Feast of Tabernacles. It was the introduction to the Messianic kingdom. They thought Jesus was coming to wipe out Rome and set up the kingdom. Now, he might be on a donkey. It might be an issue, but, uh, but he's, that's what they thought. They were all excited. What they failed to do was uh, to uh, well, accept God on his terms. See, God's terms were quite different because of the seven feasts, he was going to fulfill them in order. What was the first one he needed to fulfill? Number one was Passover. He would die on Passover as the Passover lamb to bear the sins of all, number one, as prophesied. Number two, he would fulfill the Feast of Unleavened Bread because in Christ would be no sin. He would fulfill that when he hung on the cross. Uh, number three, when he rose from the grave on the third day, he would fulfill the Feast of First Fruits in sequential order, chronological. God is very systematic. He would love DC. <laughs> he fulfilled these in order. Next was Feast of First Fruits. What was that? Well, uh, the fact that, well, when you presented your uh, first of your crop to the priest, uh, he, he would take it, and then your promise from God was there's more to come from your harvest, but you give him your best first because there's more to come. Uh, Jesus rose from the grave with the promise that there's more to come, more to come. Who's the more to come? Us, when he resurrects us. Number four was Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out in the church, uh, and then feast number five is the Feast of Trumpets. We'll come back when uh, Jesus comes back in his second coming. It's still future, still eschatological future. And then number six is the Day of Atonement when he redeems his nation, as prophesied in Zechariah 12 and 13. But what the Jews want, they want to skip all the other tough stuff and go straight to the fun stuff. Is that like us or what? See, that's what they were like. God on my terms, God on my terms. Idolatry is defined by Erwin Lutzer as reducing God to a manageable form. Mm. You want me to say it again? I didn't tell this to the last service. I'm sorry. I apologize to them. But reducing God to a manageable form, that's idolatry. You guilty? They were. They reduced God down to a form they could manage uh, and what they wanted him to do, failing to realize that according to Isaiah 53, he had to first die for the sins of the, the nation and for the world. Well, they were screaming Hosanna as he rode into town. That was on a Monday. What were they screaming at the end of the week? On Friday. Uh, the word changed completely. It went from exuberance to execution. Crucify him, they would chant rhythmically. We do not want him as our king. They crucified him on Passover, April the 3rd, 33 
A.D. You know, and I was sitting there a few minutes ago. I was thinking about April the 3rd, 33 A.D. And, and I just, sometimes God gives you a, a word when you weren't expecting it. My sister Marla died last year, right after Easter, on April the 3rd, 2018. And I was thinking to myself, sometimes God gives you a special thing, doesn't he? Because her sin was covered by that, that lamb. She's enjoying the joy of heaven today. But that's a whole other sermon in and of itself. But, I mean, my sister got to die on the most special day of the calendar. I mean, the goodness of God, right? Me, me, may he be that merciful to me on, on that day. Well, when Paul uh, thinks about uh, what the Jews did, because he talks about it in Romans chapter uh, 9, verses 1 to 5, uh, he talks about the fact that, uh, well, God uh, did great things for them. He gave them many wonderful blessings, but they blew all those blessings. They blew all those covenants, and they were, they were a nation that lived in unbelief, down to the point of when the Messiah finally came, they yelled, Hosanna at the beginning of the week, and crucify him at the end of the week, and they crucified their own anointed one as prophesied. And so the question that any Jew that was in the Roman church would be asking was, Paul, do you really think, as a, as a rabbi who's now become a Christian, do you, really, do you really think that God looks upon what we have done in, in crucifying the Messiah? Do you think that abrogates all of his promises to us? Does that nullify everything he promised to us? Are, 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 are the Jewish people as a, as a nation still part of his plan or not? They wanted to know. So Paul stops in Romans uh, 9 through 11 to answer that question because the debate was going on inside the church between the Gentiles and the Jews. What were the Gentiles telling the Jews? Jesus has come. He's the anointed one. He's bringing Jews and Gentiles into the church. He's done with the nation of Israel. Move on and just accept it and just enjoy it. The Jews were going, whoa, whoa, whoa. God promised those things, the covenants to Israel, the Abrahamic covenant, remember? The Palestinian covenant, the Davidic covenant, the new covenant, etc. Those are given to Israel, not the church. What about those things? Does God renege on his promises? So Paul's going to articulate in verses 9, 6 through following uh, the fact that uh, well, sin does not abrogate what God says that he's going to do for people, whether it's Israel, his chosen people, or the church, which is his chosen people. And so we, this is a very simple sermon. We could be out of here. It's 10, 15. We could be done by 10, 20, but it won't happen. But uh, <laughs> sometime in your lifetime. Uh, but, but it's very simple how the passage is structured, even though it's a complex chapter, to be sure, uh, because we're looking at this from a Jewish perspective, and we're Western in our thinkings, and we tend to take our Western thinking and lay it as a template over that which is Jewish, and so it becomes befuddled. So Paul says, here's a simple question that I'm going to pose in this uh, chapter, uh, as we look at verses 6 to 13. Does Israel's spiritual failure and rejection of the Messiah nullify God's promises to them as a people? Does that happen? The answer, well, the answer is very simple. The answer is no. Doesn't nullify God's promises. Why? Well, because God sovereignly chose them. So whoever God chose sovereignly, their, their misdeeds do not trump his choice of them. That's Paul's argument. So as we delve into his argument, realize he's going to develop his argument, that point, that answer, in a twofold fashion. Who's he speaking to? The Jews. Jews. And there's Gentiles in the church, but he's addressing the Jews primarily. And he's saying, because you are responsible for killing the Messiah, does that mean God's done with you as a people now that he's dealing with the church? His answer is no. He's not finished with you. And he gets to that in chapter 11 in a big way. He's going to validate that point with two, two concepts. Number one, he's going to tell the Jews, uh, well, first realize God's choice, his election of Israel, was not based primarily on heredity. It was on his sovereign choice of what he wanted to do. Not heredity. What would the Jew say? Well, I'm a Jew because it's a bloodline. What did Paul say? I'm a Jew, but... I but, but think about the Old Testament. Uh, this week we were in St. Louis uh, interviewing a, a youth uh, worship pastor for our new position for a youth worship pastor. And I think we found the guy. We're going to be bringing him out here. Uh, and it was, a, it was a great time. Uh, we flew out there with Jeremiah and, and, and Darren. It's always fun to travel with Darren. It's a lot of fun. Singing and everything all the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah but uh, but uh, we had a little time to kill when we were finished before we got on the plane. So, you know, I'd never been up in the archway. You ever been up in the arch? The gateway to the west. Uh, I'm not afraid of heights because I used to be a tree trimmer, but that was like on the edge, like <laughs> thousand feet kind of straight up. Um, but once we got up there and that little egg thing that they cram you in, and you're just like, ugh, that's like claustrophobia. And you're hearing the cables snap and pop and you're like, yeah, yeah. 
You, you got, I'm glad my salvation is secure in Christ uh, when I got into that little thing. But when we got up there, it's like, whoa, the vantage point, Mississippi down below, you can see into Illinois and then look all over the city, taking pictures of the stadium. And it was awesome. There's a vantage point. This is what Paul's doing here. It's like you've got up into the archway uh, of theology. He's going to say, let's take a long view of Israel. When God made you a nation, what are the big strokes of what he did? Now, as a sidelight, when we came down from the archway, uh, there was me and Darren and, and Jeremiah, and we got into a little egg thing uh, and hopped in there, and there's another guy in there in a full suit, uh, and he's like, hey, why are you guys here? Uh, well, we're, we're pastors from D.C. Oh, great. What do you do? I am an attorney. <laughs> it was most interesting because he looked at me and he said, sir, we may need your prayers on the way down. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah, he was worried about his salvation at that point. So a great witnessing opportunity. Back to my sermon. So Paul says you uh, become a nation not based on uh, heredity primarily. It's God's choice. Verse 6 says, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Huh? What do you mean, Paul? He says, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But, he's going to quote from uh, the Torah, Genesis, uh, through Isaac, your descendants will be named. Not through Ishmael, but through Isaac. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as his descendants. It's like whoever God chose. He didn't choose Ishmael, he chose Isaac. For this is the word of promise. At this time, God says, I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Like, how old was she? When she had a child, well, over 50, over 60, <laughs> over 70, over 80. Wouldn't you think if you were having a child uh, over 80 that you'd be thinking, this is a miracle. And we know that when God told her that she was going to have, have a child, what'd she do? Nice. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> then the name's the child Isaac, which means like he laughs. And so God says, uh, I want to first start uh, to talk to you about how you became a nation through Paul's pen based on sovereign election. I chose you, you didn't choose me. Uh, and I chose Isaac, I didn't choose Ishmael. Well, that's interesting. And notice the first clause, it says, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. Uh, the very first word in the Greek text is the word not, N-O-T. And it's placed there out of word order to get your attention. It's the Greek word ux. It's, it's like, why did he throw that there first? Because he wants you to understand there is no way God's plan for Israel as a nation is thrown off course. And the word that he uses for thrown off course, has failed, is a nautical term. Hence my next picture wait for it. See the ship? You can see the ship? It's Israel. They're on a sea of unbelief. They're in the middle of a storm. Why? Because they rejected the Messiah, the anointed one. And, and they're in a storm of all storms because they're sailing in unbelief because they didn't accept the Messiah. And so Paul's looking at them saying, is God's plan off course like a ship? I mean, is your, sh is your ship like in a storm and rudderless in this? Is it over for you as a nation? His answer is going to be no. Why? Well, he says, you've got to reflect on how God chose you as a nation. Uh, think about the character of God. Psalm 145, verse 8, says this about God. The Lord, uh, capital L-O-R-D, which is the name Yahweh, the covenant God. Uh, uh, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great in loving kindness. As a side note, aren't you glad he's that way? Because he wasn't that way, we wouldn't be in the room. And then it says in Psalm, uh, Isaiah chapter 49, God says, when I think about Israel, um, I always think about the fact that I'm loving and gracious and kind when they sin. I've, I'm that way. And then in Isaiah chapter 49, God says this. It's a question, a rhetorical question. He says, can a woman forget her nursing child? No. Nobody here has children? Uh, can, ladies, can a woman forget her nursing child? No. Why not? Lots of reasons. Lots of reasons. <laughs> They're in the know over here. Not, no way you can forget that nursing child. Why? Well, God gave you that child. It's a bundle of joy and excitement, etc. And you know, as a mother, this is just what you do to mature this child. So he says, uh, can a woman forget her nursing child? Rhetorical answer is no. Uh, and have compassion on the son of her womb. Can you forget your son that you bore? No. Even if they go off the grid, like morally speaking, spiritually speaking, when they hit 17, 18, 20, 24, can you still look at them and go, eh, totally not my son. No, your husband would look at you and say, obviously he's from your line, uh, not mine, but. <laughs> no, but you, that would, that's ridiculous. So then what's he say? He said, well, think about this. He says, even these may forget, which they really wouldn't, but even these may forget, but I, God says, I will not forget you. Who's the you? Not the church, it's Israel. He says, uh, 
Behold, uh, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. This is God speaking. That I wrote Yisrael on my hands. So when I, I mean, speaking of God in an anthropomorphic fashion, of course, but God says, if I look at my hands as I'm talking to angels or whoever, oh, Israel. And, and by the way, oh, Israel. Oh, by the way, oh, Israel. Who does he constantly see? Israel. Why? He chose them as his people first. Do you think he's going to forget somebody that he inscribed on the palms of his hands? I think not. I think not. He says in verse 6, For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. I mean, you are my people, but how did I form you as a nation? Well, it was based on my sovereign election. But not everybody from Abraham's line is Israel. Oh, interesting. Yeah, well, what happened in their history? Well, he says in verse 7, that well, they're not all children that are uh, from Adam's dis- uh, Abraham's descendants. Well, think back for just a little minute as you have, a, have that uh, view of, the, of the, the, the vantage point from the arch. You're at the top looking back at Israel's history. When God chose a nation to bless the world through, he, he's going to bring the, the, the blessing through a nation called Israel. But who was Abraham's firstborn son? Well, it wasn't Isaac. It was Ishmael. Who is his mother? This, we play Bible trivia here at the church during sermons. So that's, that's, that's basically what we're doing. Hagar. Where was she from? Egypt. So Abraham's first child didn't come from his wife. Sarah came through an Egyptian who was not a Jew, and and they named that child Ishmael. Did the nation find its origins through Ishmael? No. God did not choose the firstborn. He chose the second child. Fourteen years later, the promised child was born. God sovereignly chose. He... He's telling them, just because Abraham had two, two boys doesn't mean the nation is both boys. He says, no, God limited the nation to one people. This, our politicians haven't got the memo. <laughs> no, I kid you not. God doesn't forget these things. Why? Who's inscribed on the names, uh, names on his hands? Israel. Who's Israel? Well, they're from Isaac. They're not from Ishmael. Why could God do that? How could he do that? He'll answer those kind of questions when we get there after Easter. Uh, you have to come back. Um, so Ishmael, uh, that was Abraham's firstborn. He was not chosen to be the lion. That came from uh, uh, Isaac, and God did this because God wanted to do what God wanted to do. And who is it to argue with God? He'll get to that when we come back after Easter as well. The point of all this should not be missed. God's selection of Isaac and not Ishmael shows his sovereignty and action completely. He chose one over the other. Second thing Paul says about God's uh, not forgetting Israel, is related to when he made them a nation, his choice was not based on the action or inaction of the boy in question. Did he choose this one because he was godly, more godly than the other, a better person character-wise, blah, blah, blah. No, he says, when I chose you and I made selections, I didn't just choose between Isaac and Ishmael and I chose Isaac. When it came down to analyzing who I would choose in the line to make the nation, uh, I did it before they were born. So they didn't have to prove to me anything. Case in point, verse 10. And not only this, but there was a, he said, think about your history. There was Rebecca also. And when she had uh, conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac, uh, for though the twins were not yet born, this is important, uh, and had not done anything, good or bad, as children do after they're born. (laughs) It's right. Yeah. Uh, So that God's purpose according to his choice, not their choice, would stand not because of works, but because of him who calls. When God chose between those two boys in the womb of Rebecca, it wasn't because one is so much more spiritual than the other. No, no, no. God says, I'm going to choose the younger one, not the older one. Huh? You did that with uh, Ishmael and Isaac. But well, that's, that, I, I, that's what my plan is. My Messiah is coming through this line, and I'm choosing this boy, not that boy. And he chose them before there was the birth of those two boys. In fact, while they're in the womb, God's making his selection. And then he says here in verse 12, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger which is the wrong way things should have gone in the Middle Eastern culture, but that's what happened. And then he throws in this statement in verse 13 that really makes you raise your eyebrows. God says, just as it is written, quoting from the book of Malachi, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, a Jacob have I loved. Esau, I hated him. Wow. We'll come back to that. Do you want to come back to that? Yeah. In a couple weeks. No, I'm just kidding. No, we'll, come, we'll come back to that. Because our culture looks at the word hate and says, Terrible word. How, how, could, how could you hate? Uh, simple question. Does God hate? Sure he does. It's, what's the object 
I mean, why does he? Because it's very interesting if you do a word study on that in the Old Testament, you will find like statements in the book of Proverbs where it says, there are six things the Lord hates, yea, seven are an abomination to him. Oh, what's he hate? Two of those things that he hates are pride. Wow. We tend to uh, you know, kind of loosen what God tightens and tighten what he loosens when it comes to sin. God says, oh yeah, when it comes to sin, the seven big ones, two are pride. Amazing. So there are some things that God hates. But we'll come back. I'll explain this more in detail in just a minute. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because I'm excited to talk about God's sovereign selection. That when he picked his nation, uh, it wasn't based upon their performance. It's based on the, the absolute will of God when he chose these children. Who should he have chosen of those two boys? Esau, not Jacob. You, would he have chosen Jacob based upon just character traits? <laughs> Do you know, you know the story? Yeah, I'm, so I'm not telling you anything new. Well, he wouldn't have chosen because, like, what were the main chinks in his armor as a person? Well, he was a deceiver. He was a liar. He was a conniver. He listened to his mother, who was also a deceiver, a conniver. I mean, they had, talk about a dysfunctional family. Leads to another sermon series. Does God work in dysfunctional families? Uh, yeah. The Messiah came through a dysfunctional family. And so it made, you would never have chosen Jacob over Esau because if you were logically looking at Esau and your God and you're going to form a nation, you'd pick Esau. Why? Uh, he's a man's man. It's hairy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Hairy. He liked to hunt. He liked to eat. Give me my porridge. I mean, this is, this is what he's about. 3,000 calories a day, whatever. This is him. I mean, you're like, like, who can I pick to lead the nation? Well, not this liar over here. And God says, no, nah, when, I, when I look down in my process of a sovereign election, I'm choosing Jacob, not Esau. Wow. Well, this shows us several things. Number one, uh, God can choose who he wants to choose to be his people. Again, who's going to argue with him? You want, this will not be one of your big questions at the throne of God. Uh, number two, uh, when God chose people uh, to be his people, uh, he chose them to fight despite sin. Because who had sin? Jacob did. So what's God basically say? Well, the sin of your progenitor didn't cause me not to choose you. Therefore, I mean, just connect the dots. If you killed the Messiah, is that going to cause me to not want you as my people anymore? No. No. Because remember, he's gracious and kind and long-suffering, forgiving, and I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. I shall not forget you, no matter what. Uh, picture of Israel throughout time was one of, well, animosity toward God and the prophets. But when it came down to choosing them, God says, I chose Jacob. I didn't choose Esau. It was my sovereign choice. And he says, uh, I, I loved Jacob, and it, I hated Esau. And that happened in the womb. That's very interesting, is it not? What's it tell you about God? Um, does God hate people? No. Now, and this is where Western thinking and, and uh, Middle Eastern thinking have to well, the Western must bow to the, the Middle Eastern. Why? Well, R.C. Sproul, uh, who went home, uh, I think, last year to be with the Lord, explains God's uh, hating of Esau this way. And I think it's very insightful. He says, when the scripture speaks of God's hating, it means that he did not bestow favor upon Esau. God did not give him grace and the benefits of salvific, this is a fancy theological term for salvation, salvific love. It doesn't mean that God hates in the sense that human beings hate. Of course, this raises the question, is there arbitrariness in God? Answer, no. Is he capricious? No. Do his choices border on the irrational with no legitimate reason whatsoever? No, because he's the epitome of logic and reason. Uh, absolutely not, he says. God never does anything without a reason. It is beyond the character of God to act in a whimsical, capricious manner. God's decisions are always taken in accordance with his character. But in the specter of arbitrariness is here because the scripture makes it very clear that there is no reason in the, elect, uh, in the election why God had chosen them. But the fact that there is no reason in them does not mean that there is no reason at all. God had a reason for doing what he does. But the point is that reason does not lie within us. It, it relies in God. Therefore, who could argue with God's choice? But let's go back to the hate thing. Does it mean that God actually hated Esau? No. When you, in the Middle Eastern culture, if you sh showed favor to one son as opposed to the other son, it meant you showed favor to this one. This one did not have favor. It appeared as if it was hate, but it wasn't hate in the sense of how we connote it. Uh, in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus says this to would-be disciples of Christ. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, his wife and his children, his brothers and his sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoa, that came from Jesus. 
was Jesus telling me that I'm supposed to hate my mom and my dad to, to be a disciple of his? Well, not really. Because he's the one who also gives the command through the word to honor your father and mother. But what is he saying? Well, in hyperbolic fashion, he's saying, if you want to be my disciple, I mean, your love for me must look like you hate everybody else, that you're that and much in love with me. But it doesn't mean that you actually hate them. That's what he's saying in relationship to Esau. God sovereignly chose one boy over the other because he was bringing the Messiah through that one line, not the other line. And no sin was going to trump God's activity. I don't know about you, but I find great comfort in this because don't you sin on a given day? I'll say it again. Uh, don't, you, don't you sin on a given day? And you look at yourself and you think, I can't believe I just did that. And I told the Lord I was going to totally have my act together this week. It didn't last, did it? Yeah, and aren't you, aren't you glad that he's gracious, kind, long-suffering, et cetera, toward his church? Because see, we, we live in the church age now where God's calling Jew and Gentile into his church. But one day, the trumpet sounds, and God starts to deal with Israel again, his people, as prophesied. And he will come and redeem those who turn to him, as Zechariah prophesied in chapters 12 to 14. But right now, the, well, the gate is wide open for all to come into him and be saved. And he's merciful to those who are his children, because sometimes you don't act like a son or a daughter. But that doesn't mean his promises to you are negated because of sinful behavior. You're still his child. Israel did sinful behavior. They're still his child. I'm thankful for a God that, that fulfills his promises. In my offices is a book that contains all the promises of the Bible. You think it's thin? No. It's thick. And you can flip through all those pages, and you can look and stop at any given page and look at the promises of God and stop as a child of God and say, thank you that that is true for me no matter what. That's what he's telling Israel. I love you no matter what. I shall not forget you. That's Paul speaking to the nation. As you think about this week, think of a Savior who came to die for all of us, Jew and Gentile alike, and a God who fulfills his promise to redeem. Let's pray. God, thank you. Uh, just for the depth of Paul's pen, uh, a man who in intimately walked with you and understood you and had a most unique way to present his case of your love for Israel. Uh, we thank you for that sovereign election. We may not understand it completely with finite thinking. We thank you for your infinite thinking, and we bow before you, and we worship and adore you. And we pray for uh, ourselves that this week we might be a light to those about us who don't yet know the Savior. In Christ's name, amen.